Now, before I begin, I have a double job for you to do. And it's going to be quite disruptive, but we'll do it anyway. I want all of the girls, and that's not just our brownies and guides, but all of the girls who are school age and maybe even below, but I think mostly school age, to go around the whole of the church, upstairs and down, and shake all of the ladies' hands during the course of this sermon. Okay? You want to do that for me? Now wait for the second part in just a minute. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you've got a two-part thing to do as well here. You've got a double job to do. You've got to somehow try to listen to the sermon and at the same time keep an eye out and an ear out to be able to shake the girls and also the boys' hands in just a minute. Um, because I didn't mention the boys, did I? Boys, can you do that as well? We've got some boys here that are school age and below. Could you do the same for the gentlemen? Would that be okay? If you go around everybody upstairs and downstairs and shake all the gentlemen's hands. Now, adults, if you were a guider, brownie or full-blown guider, or a scout, when the girls and the boys come around to shake your hand, shake their hand first of all, please do, but if you were a guider or a scout yourself, can you give me a salute? Okay, brilliant, there's a few doing it already. Hold it. <laughs> Wait till the boys and the girls come round. Now, boys and girls, the second job you've got to do when you go round is, as well as shake people's hands, is notice if they've given you the, the guides or the scouts salute and try to remember how many you saw as you went round. I could do this easy and ask people to just put their hands up, but I'm feeling like being difficult today. If you try and count and remember and bring it back to Brownell afterwards, would that be okay? And we'll see if we can get a total up. We'll find that out for the end of the service a little bit later on. Have you got that? So the girls, if you can see all the ladies and shake their hands, just take your time. There's plenty of time. It's not going to be a long sermon, but you've got plenty of time. <laughs> it's honestly not going to be a long sermon. <laughs> and boys, a few similarly, and that includes some of the boys that aren't out the front. If you're of school age, could you go around all the gentlemen, please? Try not to double up, if you can. So you might want to go to different parts of the church so that you're not doubling up, and we'll try and get those numbers together for a little bit later. Have you got that? Off you go. Why don't you start just now? That's great. Thank you. Now, back to the sermon. This is the hard bit, trying to listen to this and not watch all the handshakes as that goes on as well. In our Old Testament reading today, from Leviticus chapter 19, we heard these words. This is a slightly different translation, but we heard these words. The Lord told Moses to say to the community of Israel... Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And when you think about that, what does it mean to be holy? I'm not talking about darning your socks. I'm not talking about darning your coat. What does it mean to be holy? Does it mean to be perfect somehow? Is that the expectation of each of us? Well, possibly, but the word holy actually means something more akin to being dedicated or consecrated. Basically, set apart or different. If you or I were holy, that would be that we'd be set apart for a specific role and generally perhaps a little bit different. That doesn't necessarily mean being perfect. And let's be honest, none of us are even if we occasionally think we would uh, uh, like to be. I think it's a fair assumption, however, that we do, however, try to do our best. There's probably none of us that don't, in some way or another, try to do our best. When we join an organisation to try and do some good, there too, we set ourselves apart and start doing something a little bit different, or perhaps with a different level of dedication. Maybe that's the change, a different level of dedication. Our brownies and our guides and the scouts are set apart, and later the girls will have an opportunity to renew their promise. Our boys' brigade, similarly, are set apart. As Christians, we are set apart. Allegedly is different, certainly, hopefully, different in our dedication. Our dedication to do what God wants us to do. Our dedication to believe in Jesus 
and to follow him, to love him, and to be dedicated to him. Now, we're not perfect in that, far from it. We're not holy Joes, but we try our best. Because our best is actually all we've got to offer. And perhaps with God's help, we sometimes manage to do better than we expect, and maybe at other times not quite as well as we would hope, but then we are as is only human. Some, by God's grace, seem to do better than others. Let's give God the glory for that, if somehow we're able to do better than others. Because surely we can't take all that credit to ourselves. Even Jesus did that, giving credit to his Father in heaven. What better example do we have of someone who was wholly dedicated to everything he did in respects of God, and someone who cared for the poor and the vulnerable who are around and about him. In every aspect of his life, you hear stories of this, that, and the other that he did to try to help and care for the vulnerable. Now, not always, but often, that's accompanied with becoming members in his church. We start openly showing that we follow Christ. Not just alone, but in company with others. As Christ's own church here on earth, which is far more than just one or two congregations. Far, far more. If there were 10 million guides and brownies and the Girl Scouts and 140 uh, countries that were represented by the guiding movement, how many more are represented by Christianity, by way of countries and individuals as well? Far, far more. But the question for us really is, what difference does it make in our lives? What difference does it make in our lives, our Christianity? You see, if we're dedicated to doing God's will and following Christ, you'd probably expect that something would change, either in how we behave or what we do, or certainly our level of dedication, our efforts. So when you think about it on this thinking day, what changes? Well, even in the Old Testament, we find examples of things that show that we are dedicated to doing God's will. I want to turn back to Leviticus 19 for a moment and pick up the reading again there from verse 9. I just noticed some of these examples. Leave something for the poor. Not necessarily a handout, but help them out. Do not steal or cheat or lie. Do not make a promise in my name if you don't intend to keep it. That brings disgrace on God's name. Do not rob or take advantage of anyone. If you owe someone something, especially an employee, do not hold it back even for one night. Do not swear at the deaf or trip up the blind. Be honest and just when you make decisions in legal cases. Do not show favoritism to the poor or fear the rich. Do not spread lies or gossip about anyone. And when someone is on trial for their life, speak out if you can at all help them. Do not bear a grudge against others, but settle your differences with them so that you do not commit a sin because of them. Do not take revenge on others or continue to hate them, but love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that last statement, love your neighbor as you love yourself, pretty much sums up them all. The one that Jesus, when he was asked about the greatest two commandments, stated that we should love the Lord our God with our mind and our heart and our strength and our soul, and also that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, if we could keep all of that, all of that, 
perhaps we would be perfect. Especially if we go the extra mile and the extra love that uh, Jesus indicated in our reading in Matthew chapter 5 in not just loving our neighbors as ourselves and just being wholly just about also maybe hating our enemies as well, but if we even love our enemies too. A very difficult thing indeed. But if we are dedicated to doing God's will, we ought to think about this. How can we help one another? Here, at home, and abroad. And especially, how can we help the most vulnerable in society? Just as Jesus himself did. It takes a special kind of dedication. It takes true Christianity. It would naturally set us apart. You and me. And that's, perhaps, real holiness. Not never putting a foot wrong in life much as we would like to manage it. The Lord told Moses to say to the community of Israel, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Amen.